So this is the first neoadjuvant study to be reported in early stage triple negative breast cancer, which looked at the value of adding pembrolizumab to carbotaxol followed by AC neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Then patients had surgery, the primary endpoint was PCR, then pembrolizumab was continued for a year, all patients were on placebo. So there are two primary endpoints of PCR and event-free survival. So this presented the PCR endpoint. So the thing to note in the patients that were in this trial is that half the patients were node negative and three quarters of the patients had stage T1, T2 tumours. So you're not, it's not the highest risk population. And the most interesting thing is that compared to the advanced setting where we had the recent approval of a TZO, that most patients, so 80% of patients, were PDL1 positive by the Merck assay. So that's very different to the Impassion 130 data where only 40% of patients were PDL1 positive. So the primary endpoint for PCR was significant. There was a statistically significant increase in the rate of PCR with the addition of pembrolizumab. The control arm PCR rate was about right at 50%. The delta was around 13.6%. So that was strongly significant. So the interesting thing is if you look down at PDL1 versus positive versus negative, you can see that PDL1 patients who are positive do better compared with PDL1 negative patients. However, it does seem that the delta, so the change in PCR with the addition of pembrolizumab, did look to be relatively better, surprisingly, in the PDL1 negative patients compared with the PDL1 positive patients. That doesn't mean they did as well as the PDL1 positive patients, but the relative increase surprisingly looked a little bit better. So that was very surprising to me. Um, and for me, it really is very different from the advanced data where we saw effects only in pd one positive patients. So here we're seeing it across the board. Um, and it really does make me wonder about the effects of myelosuppressive chemotherapy on patients who have a pre-existing immune response. And in reality, we don't know what chemotherapy is doing to a pre-existing immune response. And it's highly plausible that giving such myelosuppressive chemotherapy is detrimental to the immune response which is pre-existing, such as those in pd one positive patients, as well as that that we're trying to facilitate. So that's what my, you know, that's one interesting take on that. Um, and I think we um, need to investigate that further. So I think it's a landmark study. It's important to have a proper control arm so we know that pembrolizumab adds they did show early event-free survival data, but I think that's way too early. We really, it's encouraging, but we really need to wait. The adverse event rate with regards to immune-related adverse events was um, consistent with other studies, but we need to remember that 10 to 15% of these will be lifelong. So patients will require permanent replacement of endocrine function lifelong. And for example, you know, Type 1 diabetes is extremely rare, but giving a patient type 1 diabetes can be you know, devastating um, if they're going to be alive for a long time. So we need to wait for long-term data outcomes. We need to understand the benefits. Um, we need to see the other trials, and we also need to understand the safety of these agents. And I think to me, it really suggests we really need to work out what chemotherapy is doing to patients with a pre-existing immune response. We know that patients who do have a pre-existing immune response, they're doing really well without pembrolizumab. So what's chemo doing? You know, how can we optimise the chemo-pembrolizumab combination? You know, is one year too much? Is it too little? Um, how can we understand that maybe with biomarkers? Um, and we need to understand who needs the um, pembrolizumab. You know, there's no doubt in my mind that it will help patients be cured of their triple negative breast cancer. But it's a fine line, I guess, who we um, give it to.